Francine, welcome to Facing the Canon. Thank you, it's nice to be here. Well, we're thrilled that you're uh, on the programme. Well, let's start at the beginning. Where were you born? Berkeley, California. And your father was a policeman, was your a police mother officer. was a nurse? Yes. What was it like growing up? Uh, they built their own home from the ground up, so I love the smell of sawdust. And they would, as they could afford, they would add a room. Uh, it took about 12 years to build that house, and we were out in the country. So I was not a reader. I was hiking and riding my bike and building mud pies and forts and things like that. So. And uh, you had a brother? You've I got had an older brother. Yes. Uh, and we fought like cats and dogs until, <laughs> until he grew into, co into high school, and then he just decided we weren't going to fight anymore. So... I tried, but you tried. it didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Now, you, you're married to Rick. Yes, I am. How long have you been married? We're going on 49 years. 49, congratulations. <laughs> and so we've known each other since we were 10 years old. Ooh. Yeah, so you're about to get the gold medal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> any, any plans for the big 50th? I, I don't know. Mm. Do we have any plans? <laughs> no. Now, where, how, where, uh, tell us how you and Rick met. Uh, well, we met in grade school, and we were good friends. And he had a girlfriend in high school, but when he would, after he'd have a date, he'd come down and talk to me because I loved to travel. I'd, I wanted to travel. And his mother said, um, why don't you break up with that girl and date Francine? And, <laughs> And, and he said, she's too bossy. Oh. <laughs> so after a stint in the Marine Corps, I, he was able to handle me. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so. the, the, uh, the situation with, uh, with regards to you reconnecting, um, your brother was in, in a difficult situation. Yes, yes he was serving in, uh, he was in the Army, and he was serving in Way and in intelligence. And when the city of Way fell, he was captured. And it came out in the hometown paper. And Rick's mother wrote to him every day that he was in Vietnam. And he didn't get any of the letters while all that was going on. But when the battle was over and the Marines had taken the city again, he started opening the letters. And the first one was about my brother being captured. The second one was about him being found 10 days later. Um, and so he wrote to me in, at college and just said, you're lucky to have your brother back because most of them don't come back. And then we started corresponding. He came home, and we were married a year to the day that he came home. So he, now, looked, he looked so buff when he came home. <laughs> 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 Handsome Marine, how could I resist? <laughs> and when you got uh, married, where did you live? Uh, where did we live? We lived in, um, we ended up at El Toro, which no longer exists. He was still in the Marine Corps, so we were living in an apartment in Southern California. And then he got an early out to go back to college, and we moved in with his parents briefly, and then found an apartment in, in San Leandro, and then bought a house in inner city Oakland. So those early years of marriage, um, I gather, were a little bit stormy? Yes, they were. We were both very strong-willed, and it was a matter of who's in control of this marriage. So. And who was? <laughs> well, it was a toss-up. <laughs> no, because you know we sometimes yeah. say uh, two become one yes. on the wedding day, and then the day after the honeymoon you discover which one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. So someone was a little bit surprised. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Oh. Well, and we weren't, we weren't Christians at the time. I grew up in the church, and so I thought I was a Christian. I mean, in America, it's sort of you are born a Christian, right? But um, we were not going to church for a long time. We tried church, but um, it didn't click at that time. So we were, we were basically trying to do things on our own and control things. And Rick went back to college uh, at UC Berkeley. A lot of things going on. And it, it was just a real adjustment. And I, Th of course, I had... This is when Rick returned from Vietnam? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And... Um, he was in Vietnam before we got married, but um, there was just a lot of baggage that I brought in from the college years, and then he had the trauma of Vietnam and losing friends over there. So, so your, your college that. years were a little bit colorful, weren't they? Yeah, yes they were. And um, so even though you were brought up in a sort of a churchy home, yes. you went off to college and kind of Left. went God wild. Behind. Well, not super wild, but wild enough to make some major mistakes. 
and then obviously some of the the scars of that or yes. the bruises of that were taken into your marriage absolutely yeah. so okay how did you both come to faith well we tried church in southern california and jesus had left the building and we didn't realize he wasn't there uh, rick actually became the chairman of the board of trustees they didn't know he wasn't a christian we didn't know we weren't christians uh, and then we decided that we were struggling in our marriage and I, we went out on a walk once and Rick said, if you had a choice between your writing and me and the children, you'd take your writing. And I thought, he's right. There's something really wrong with me and my priorities. So we thought the best way to kind of fix things would be to move north and be closer to family so, and start a business. And so we sold the house. I moved into a rental until the children were through with college, with, uh, not college, but with school that year. And Rick moved north, started his business, and was looking for a rental home. And uh, the only home that there was available in Sebastopol, right at the last minute, was between two Christian families. And in one house, when we were moving in, probably the hottest day of the year in August, and this little boy, about eight, came over and wanted to help us move in. And we didn't want to be bothered by a little eight-year-old no. neighbor, you know, go home, it's leave like us buzz alone. buzz off. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the right time. I think we tried that and it didn't work. No. Uh, but Rick finally just gave him a few things to carry in and on the way in he's going, have I got a church for you? <laughs> and on the other side was another Christian family and she was bringing over apple pie and we were getting to know them. And a few weeks later I went to that church and that church changed us. So completely different to what you'd experienced Yes, yes. The, the pastor was teaching straight out of scripture. He would like take the book of Ephesians and start at chapter one, verse one. What, what is the context? What's the history behind it? Where did it come from? Who's writing it? And then what are the scriptures saying and how does it pertain to your life today? And it just was what I had been waiting to hear my whole life. And I, I couldn't get Rick to go. And so I asked the pastor that he had had enough of church. He, he was mowing the lawn of the church in Southern California, which was like an acre and a half or something by himself. Um, and he said, I don't really want to go to church. So I asked the pastor if he'd be willing to teach a home Bible study. And he said, if your husband's agreeable. And Rick said, sure, that's fine. So the, the whole point was, you know, if you can't get your husband to church, you bring the church to your husband. Very good. But so yeah. you asked the pastor first. Yes. And then you said to Rick, Rick, yes. would it be all right if the minister <laughs> yes. came and did Bible study? Oh, you're getting you're getting the control issue there. Yes. No, 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 no. <laughs> just the just manipulation mentioning side. it. Yeah. And but Rick was very yeah, receptive. He was very open to it. Yeah. He thought, well, at least I don't have to travel anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and then yeah. gradually did the, well, how Rick came to faith? Yes, well, we were doing uh, the Gospels, we were doing topical studies, and then we just, we did baptism. And we decided, we were both baptized on the same day in 1986. And so. how did that experience, that time change your lives and a help in your marriage? Well, it, um, <laughs> I know what you want to hear, but uh, it completely blew me apart. I mean, it, it, when you bring Christ into your life, it changes everything. And the first thing that happened to me is I couldn't write anymore. And I had been writing in the general market for a number of years, and, and it had become an idol in my life. And it took three years for God to get through to me about that. So I was helping Rick with the business, and we were raising three children. And it took that long to understand what God was trying to tell me, that you want to be my child, but you, you don't even know who I am. You need to get to know me. So I was reading the Bible through. Somebody had given me a one-year Bible, and that's the first way I read through, and I've been doing that pretty much every year since. Um, and then, of course, we started doing a study on the minor prophets. And when we came to Hosea, I felt like God saying, this, you've been writing romance for years the world's view of romance, but this is the romance I want you to write about, my, God, my love for my people. So, so we'll just backtrack a little. So you went okay. to university. Did you do English and journalism? Uh, I majored in English with an emphasis in literary writing and minored in journalism because then, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know what I was going to be writing. 
And then was it your mother-in-law that passed to you yes. some books on historical romance? Historical. Was she trying to spice up your marriage? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, possibly. No. It'd be more like his grandmother that would be spicing things <laughs> up. She was but but yeah. she was it your mother-in-law that first yes. gave you those? Yeah. And had you read any books like that before? Not really. I would tried the classics, but I'm embarrassed to say I really didn't like the classics. Um, and she was passing me um, popular fiction, you know, gothics, romances, historical novels. And I just thought, this is wonderful. I'd like to write this. And I, the first book I wrote was a combination of the genres that I liked. I liked westerns, I liked gothics, and I liked romances. So it was a western gothic romance. <laughs> and it didn't really fit anywhere. It took, I think it was turned down 13 times and then published. But it was so much fun. I was hooked. And th but then you wrote several of those. Yes. I, yeah. And actually, pretty successful, because you yes. sold about five million. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> and then you become, oh, by the way, you've tried to buy the copyright for all of those books. I have books. all the rights back to all the books. Is that to priv prevent further yes. publications? Yeah. One was actually published I think in 2006, not with my permission, and we had to contact a lawyer and tell him you can't publish it, you don't have the rights to it, but it was the original company selling it to another company and then they put it out as a new book. So I ended up putting a letter online saying don't, don't buy anything before Redeeming Love, because Redeeming Love is really the beginning of my Christian writing it's career. It's like the new you. Yeah, it's, that's the BC life. Yes. And I want you to read the AD life, you know. So, so you, so. yeah, so you, yeah. Are you, is that a way of saying you're not proud of your BC life and your BC books? It's just a different message. It's more, uh, I would rather they read about Jesus. So you so. come to faith, you're born again, mm -hmm which is a great expression, uh, of course, it's something that Jesus said yeah. to Nicodemus, but for you, that is very fitting. It, you literally were born again. Yes. There was this experience of the caterpillar dying and the uh, yeah. uh, butterfly being birthed. Yeah. And so there's this new you, uh, but then you didn't write for several years. Yeah. Very frustrating. I tried, didn't work. <laughs> So and it took that long for God to get through to me, I think, to, to teach me that you need to put me first. I need to be first priority, and you need to know who I am. And when I didn't care if I ever wrote again, that's when he gave it back to me. Can you remember a particular day or week or whenever where you actually said to the Lord, Lord, if you don't want me ever to write again, I won't? I don't remember a particular day. I just remember it took three years. <laughs> And it just, all of a, I just stopped thinking about it. Didn't bother me anymore. There were, you know, you fall in love with the Lord and you don't need anything else. And then he, it, it was a question to me, that why would you ask me to write again when that was so important? Um, so you felt like a prompting of the spirit yes, to start definitely, again. Definitely. And then from that prompting, how did it become redeeming love? Well, it was Hosea. The book of Hosea got through to me like no other book in the Bible, and I don't know why, but it, it just, I was amazed at how much he loves us. And I thought, well, I've been writing these love stories for all these years, but here's the real thing, and there's a very definite difference. And I just felt like he was telling me to write the story. So, and so I put it in the same time period that I'd been writing in before, because I was getting letters from people, why aren't you writing? And I thought, well, why not write for them so they understand what's happened in my life? So it, be, it became really my statement of faith that that was then. This is what I thought love was, but this is the real thing. And how easy was it to publish this completely different type of book? Very difficult because the publisher that had done my books before recognized it as being an allegory about Jesus. And they said, we don't publish those kind of books. So as it happens, you know, these accidents, there was a Christian uh, editor who was at Bantam at the time, and she was looking for books about Jesus to bring into the general market. 
And so she purchased Redeeming Love, and it came out originally as a Bantam book. And then I, when I entered the Christian market, I got the rights back a few years later, and then I was able to make some changes in it. And it came out, the, new, the version that you have out there on the yes. table is the redeemed version of Redeeming Love. <laughs> So, so d did it surprise you um, how popular it became? Uh, yes, it's still, but it's always been God's book and he'll do whatever he wants with it. You know, it's, it was always his from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about writing it. How long did it take you to write? Yeah, it took a year, and I wasn't sure about the main character, Angel, and I read an article in a women's magazine and it was about uh, a little girl who had disappeared about the age of eight, and they had a picture of her, like a school picture, just this innocent, beautiful little girl, and then they found her in a pornographic film, and she had this look of terror on her face, and then they had another picture of her at about the age of 12, and totally changed, you know, just this dead yes. eyes, and so I had her picture on my bulletin board uh, in front of my typewriter, I, th I think I was actually trying to use a computer at the time, uh, and I, I felt like I was writing for her, that this is a story I wanted her to have because she had been forced into prostitution. Yes. So. And then uh, how, how does it work for a writer? Where do, you, where do you get your ideas from? Are you very much like start the same time each day? How does it work for you? Uh, pretty much in the mornings I start and then I, I, I begin at the beginning and I work my way through and I, a lot of times I don't know where I'm going. But when you have something to base it on like Hosea, I knew what it was about. And I, it's probably the only project where I felt like Jesus was sitting right next to me telling me the story because I didn't have a past like she did, and yet I had to go into her. And I, I tried to rewrite that, I think, two or three times, and it just wasn't working. And it, just to go inside somebody that's suffering like that and to try to, to be, enter their mindset and present that, it was a, quite a journey. So, uh, you had children at the time? Yes. How old were your children? Pretty small. How did you juggle husband, children, trying to write? Well, they were, we, we were all in the same living room. It was a small rental with three bedrooms and a, and a living room. So um, a lot of times they were all right there behind me. And I had a little cubby and the desk was there and I had my bulletin board behind it and the TV would be going. I, I really learned, I started writing when they were small, like babies. And I would put the baby will go when we had three. Uh, baby would be in the cradle behind the typewriter because I was using a typewriter at the time. And then the second one would be in the bottom of the military desk drawer which got me a big military desk. And so our daughter would be napping in the drawer and then the youngest would, or the other one would be in a playpen. So they kind of grew up with the sound of the typewriter keys and it was a comfort to them. And as they got older, um, I would ask them about their dreams, and then they would tell me some of the dreams, and then I would just ask questions, and we'd build a story, and I'd put that in the file. So they had an idea that what mommy does for a living is write stories. Yes. So, so in the midst of all of this going on, yeah. I mean, did you not lose your train of thought? Oh, I think you do it on occasions. But then? But then you just, you get so focused. And I also felt like I needed to limit the amount of writing I did a day because it had been too important. So I was writing about four pages a day. Four pages a day? Four pages a day. So that would be a success if that you could do four pages. That would be a big pages. success, four pages a day. And you'd start at what time? Um, I think probably 8.30 in the morning, 8, 8.30. And how long would four pages take? I could take anywhere from a couple of hours to you know two o'clock in the afternoon, and I bribed my children. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you let mommy write, we'll go to the park, yes. we'll go out to the beach. We were about 45 minutes to the beach, so I'd take them out to Salmon Creek and they could run around out there. So they were very cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> but did you get lots of uh, letters from people from all over the world regarding I, Redeeming Love? On Redeeming Love I did, yeah. How, how did you feel reading people's uh, responses? and? 
Um, some were heartbreaking because they, they came from women who were prostitutes or they were in the exotic dancing industry or they were overseas. Um, that was really disturbing. And I, I, it wasn't until later that I realized the, the real connection and how it was being used in ministry to sex traffic survivors and also in battered women's shelters. And so it, but like I say, it was God's book from the beginning. So it's what he does. I, he, he can use anything he wants to reach his people. And it, it's just, I felt like I was being obedient to what he wanted me to do. And then he was doing what he wanted to do with it. You went on and wrote a number of different other, other books and mm. series and things. Um, and then you incorporated a bit of your own life story. Oh, lots in there, yeah. In there, which, which, which book tells more of you? Well, they all do. They all start with a question. But probably the hardest book I ever had to write was The Atonement Child, which yes. dealt with my college, uh, college years and the abortion that I had, and just dealing with that. And I remember going to um, the Pregnancy Counseling Center because I wanted to do research. And I w so I thought maybe learning how to be a counselor would help. But I kept seeing the number of crosses that represented the children that had been killed. And I thought, well, do all the mothers feel the way they, that I do? You know, like that, n you never lose that sense of, of guilt and shame. So I raised my hand and they said, oh, you need to be in the post-abortion class. So I was going through that class as I was writing the book. And every character in the book is impacted by abortion in some way. But it was also, it was the hardest book I ever had to write, but it was also the most healing. Because I, I really fought God on that one. I did not want to go there. And I talked to my mother about it, and then she shared with me that she had had a therapeutic abortion, and I would have had a, a brother. And when she was telling me, she was saying he would have been in, you know, like 44 years old. And she was weeping, and I, that's when I thought, you know, we have to talk about this. We can't yes. keep it hidden. And but we have to be able to grieve. And she had to have one, otherwise she would have lost her own life. Yes, she yes. had tuberculosis, tuberculosis, and the doctors felt she wouldn't survive. But she felt, you know, she was telling me, I think I would have. And it was something that my dad and my mom never discussed it again. She had written diaries all of, from the age of 17 all the way until three weeks before she died of breast cancer. And three years were missing, and it was during that time when she would have had the abortion. So it just, it impacted, it impacts people in ways that they never tell you. No, sure. They don't talk about it. Uh, obviously, for you, um, having an abortion was your pre-Christian days. Yes. Um, you've thought about it a lot. You've written about it. Uh, what would you say to anyone that has had an abortion um, and thinks about it a lot, or not has had one anyway, but well, one what would you would say? Well, one would be go to a post-abortion class and to, because you learn the nature of God and you also learn, you know, you learn that, yes, it's sin. Yes, you have sinned greatly, but God loves you and can redeem you. And he can, you can experience the forgiveness that you couldn't otherwise without going to him. He's the healer. Yeah. Do you think sometimes though, uh, Francine, uh, it's a bit like you have an operation and um, you recover, but you still got the scar. Yes. Do you think yeah. sometimes with our choices in life, we, we still got the scars. Oh, I think so. But I also think that, you know, I look at that and I think, well, but God, would, he uses everything in our lives, whatever happens, he can use it for his good purpose when we turn it over to him. Because I, I couldn't have written The Atonement Child. No. And it, I got lots of letters from people from that particular book. So it was, it was healing for a lot of people, which it's like, thank, thank God it was. Do, do you sometimes, uh, you don't call yourself this, but do you sometimes feel that you're a little bit of a pastor? Because no. your books have <laughs> a, quite a pastoral effect on people. Well, I, that's, I would hope so, but no, no. I, I look no. at pastors and I think, no, they're, they're in the firing line all the time. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm anonymous, I can be in my little office. And Are you able to cope with all the letters that you've received? What do you do with them? Well, I usually I answer the ones that are directed to me, and, um, and then I destroy them. Yeah. I don't save them, because they're very personal stories, and I wouldn't want anybody else to ever get a hold of them. So I don't save fan letters.
You keep writing. Mm -hmm. Are you currently writing? No. <laughs> your last I'm book. in waiting mode. All right, tell us about yeah. your last book, uh, the your last most recent. Uh, the last book was The Masterpiece, and it was really, the, a question usually starts the different uh, books, and this one had to do with how many broken people we have in our country. Um, broken families, broken, you know, just children that have been abused and the impact of traumatic events on children when they're young and how that affects their thinking as adults. And I thought, well, can you, could two really broken people ever be whole together and how would that work? And of course, with Jesus at the center, it can. So. Absolutely. Yeah. So you're having another little break. Yeah, I'm just trying to figure out what God wants me to do next. So you're, you're very calm, which is very nice, <laughs> actually. <laughs> you're not in a hurry, because no. you've realized God's not really in a hurry. No, he's not. No. He's, he's kind of giving me a little bit to think about right now and mentoring. Now, both you and Rick, you're involved in a number of different uh, initiatives um, locally yes. where you live. Yeah. Um, tell us about some of those. Well, we're, we're involved in um, Crossing the Jordan, which is, has been a startup. It started up about six years ago, and they, they um, help people that are on the street. They also help women coming out of prison to be together with their children. They help drug addicts and alcoholics, and they have a very different way of doing things. So the, the two people that started the organization are both federal ex-cons out of prison. And the gentleman actually was in and out of San Quentin several times. Yeah. Uh, but they're on fire Christians, and they, what they do is that a person comes into their program, it's an 18-month program, and they, if they have a special talent, like a, um, a tree trimmer, as an example, then they will help them establish a business within the ministry, and they put them to work. And it's actually the work, the different businesses that they're establishing that helps to finance the, the organization and keeps them off the street. And it's all Christian-based. You know, they, it's just an amazing thing to watch. I, I love getting together with them because they're, they're brilliant. They were brilliant as criminals, yes. but they are brilliant now as legitimate, you know, uh, and on-fire Christians. It's just fun to watch them. So do you and Rick go and volunteer at these places? Well, we, we support them and we go to their functions and we stay in contact with them and have lunch with them and talk ideas and that kind of thing. So your heart, what, what, what's God, is that what God has put on your heart? Well, I don't know. I'm, I'm sort of in wait mode. We're, we're hoping to have a movie on redeeming love, and so I worked for quite a while on the script for that. Um, is, that how, is that quite hard work, taking your original book and creating a It's script? very different because everything's visual. So it was a whole different craft, and it's really a... Um, a technical document more than a creative thing because you have to have the direction in there and the sets and the give information about the costuming all that kind of stuff so it was interesting yeah. and kind of fun to do and that must have taken a lot of time to do as well yeah it did take a couple months to do it but the the hardest part was there's so much going on in angel and michael's head what they're thinking that you can't have in a movie it all has to be visual has to be through dialogue and through expression. So that was a challenge. And you'd not done that before, so that was... I'd never done that before. No. No. But they asked you to do it? No, well, they did not. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't want anyone else to do I it? I read other scripts and I felt like no. they just weren't getting who Michael was. So I thought, I'm gonna try it myself. And are they happy with it? They are happy with it, yeah. My, th I have two agents, one that's in Hollywood and one that is my literary agent, and I sent the script to both of them, and they didn't read it for quite a, quite a while, and I thought they must think it's, they're worried about hurting my feelings if it's really bad. <laughs> so I just said, I'm a big girl, you can tell me. So yes. they read it, and they said, yeah, it's good, so. Well, that's think, encouraging, isn't yeah. it? So hopefully, yeah. maybe uh, a God whole willing. load more people being exposed yeah. to the story, yeah. and, um, of God's redeeming grace. Yeah. Well, if God wants it on a screen, he'll put it there. So Abs we'll see. 
Absolutely. So you, mm. you, you, I like your little throwaway little statements, if God wants, you know. Yeah. So obviously it's you're implying the sovereignty of God. Yes, yes. How would you explain the sovereignty of God? Oh, do you want me to tell that story? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a real hard time with sovereignty, and Rick was on a business trip, and he was coming home, and he was going to be driving from San Francisco up to Weaverville, which is in Northern California. And I wouldn't be seeing him. He would be going straight up there. So I was sound asleep and woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning with just a strong urging to pray for Rick. And I called. Uh, he was meeting a friend up there. So I called the friend's wife the next day and, and said, have you heard from Barry? And she said, why? And I said, because I woke up last night. She said, 3 o'clock in the morning? And I said, yes. And she said, I woke up with the urge to pray for Rick at 3 o'clock in the morning. So the two of us were praying. So she w is a very strong Christian. So yes. she said, we'll have to find out what happened at 3 o'clock in the morning. So when Rick called home, I asked. And he had fallen asleep at the wheel. So at I, 3 o'clock in the at morning? At 3 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And I, I thought, um, you know, it, God is sovereign. He, I think he was just saying, see, I was with you. I was with Peggy, I was with your husband, don't worry. And it, it just struck me that, okay, I understand now, I don't have to worry. Doesn't so, mean I don't worry. So you see it, yeah. <laughs> so you see it uh, as God waking you up yeah. to, Not to say remind Rick, you, to tell me, I'm okay. sorting Rick out, yeah. rather than getting you to pray so that the problem can be sorted out. Yeah, just teaching me something that I wasn't getting any other way. <laughs> but why, why do we struggle so much to believe God? Because he's so awesome. And we're so small. I mean, we're, we have no concept. It's like it, I think the longer you're a believer, the bigger he becomes and the more, the more amazing. To, to try to define him kind of puts him in a box. I, I remember one year I was reading through the Bible and I had a notebook and I was writing down every attribute. I thought, I'm going to write down every attribute of God. Well, I filled the whole entire notebook. I thought, I'm never going to understand God, not in the fullest capacity. So just accept and enjoy and trust. Do you ever doubt God? I struggle with trust. Um, that's been one of my things. I think that, you know, he doesn't answer my prayers quickly enough. <laughs> but it's like, okay, it's wait, it's no, or it's yes. So, but I, I tend, I think I tend to worry about my loved ones more than anything. Yes. You know, when are they going to be all saved? You know, are they all going to follow Jesus? And we want to all be together in heaven. That's the kind of thing I, I'm concerned about. And, and there again, I, the hardest thing for me to learn is letting go and letting God work. You know, because he loves them more than I do. When you're, you've written many, many different stories, does, uh, do, do the, your own stories give you a faith lift? Well, they teach me lessons, that's for sure. It's usually, when I go in with a question, I don't have the answer. Uh, like with A Voice in the Wind, it's how do I share my faith with unsaved family and friends that don't want to hear the name of Jesus and they are not going to pick up a Bible and read it. And what I learned in the process of writing that story was you live it. You walk the walk, and people are watching all the time. And then sometime they will ask the question. And you don't have to prepare a memorized answer of the four steps of salvation or whatever. God puts the words in your mouth that you need to say that they need to hear. And so each, each book has kind of been teaching me something. And th there will be a moment that I wait for, where you just get that tingly feeling of, that's the lesson. It may take me a year to get there, but then there's the lesson, there's what God is trying to teach me through the writing. And writing is really a way for me to draw closer to God. It's kind of a form of worship for me. What, why, do you think, why do you think Christians are so reluctant to share their faith? I think fear. That, and that was part of the issue in that book is, you know, why am I afraid when I live in a country like America where you can talk about anything? Uh, where people in Rome were getting burned or fed to the lions, and yet they were sharing their faith. 
So I think it's uh, just learning to trust in God and just being able to speak out, because I could speak out about my faith after that. So it's getting to know him and trusting him. So, okay, let's be a little bit practical here. Uh -oh. Okay, how, 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 do, have you, how do you share your faith with your family, extended family, and your neighbors? Well, one of the sneaky things that we did is we made sure that our grandchildren all went to Christian schools. Yes. And then when we get together one time a year, basically, for Christmas, then we have one of the grandchildren reads the Christmas story. Um, but, and we talk about it whenever we can. And we have two that go to church. We have one that doesn't, um, but they believe, but they don't want anything to do with the church, which saddens us, but it's like, how do you get the millennials into the church? Um, but just, you know, any opportunity that we have. But we've learned, too, that, you know, it's, they have to have their own faith. It can't be, it's not inherited from us. It's not our faith. They have to come to Christ on their own. Do you think there might be a book where you can tell the story, answer the story, um, how to uh, welcome people who don't like church to be part I of church. I don't know. That might be the next thing to study because that, that's yeah. what we're working on in our church right now is how to reach out um, because change is difficult for a lot of the older people and, you know, yeah. and we're getting to be the older people. Yeah. <laughs> it's like we like the hymns. We like things done a certain way and yet you know, if you want to reach the young people, you have to reach them where they are and maybe it's through the music or whatever. But you need to make them welcome outside the church and draw them into the church. So I think that I heard the term Masada Christians, you know, yes. where we go inside of a building and we lock the doors and we lock the windows and we don't want to be influenced by the world. We need to be outside the walls of the church influencing the world. And it's not always easy to get people out of the church to do that. Yeah. So. But the message of Christianity is an incredible message. And, and you're yes. trying to communicate that and convey yes. that through all the books that you've... You're basically a Bible storyteller. Yeah. Is that, is that how you... I think so, yeah. I mean, you're just retelling the story of the Bible. Well, so I, I try to use names sometimes from the Bible, too, so that people that read the Bible will recognize what part they're going to play in the story. That's not always the case, but sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you hinted earlier on that you read through the Bible. Do you read through the Bible every year? I try to read through the Bible every year. I think I stopped one year and it really bothered me. Uh, I missed it. But I, I want to, like this year I'm reading through the one-year Bible again. Uh, but next year I want to read the chronological one-year Bible because that puts it all in chronological order. You know, so yes. you know when the prophets were speaking to the kings and all that. So. But it's fascinating. Just help us kind of look into how you do this. Oh. So what's your typical, uh, as we would say, quiet time each day? How does that work? Uh, well, Rick, and Rick gets up very early in the morning. He gets up at about 3 o'clock in the morning. And then I get up later, uh, 5.30 or 6. <laughs> you, you, you know the 3 o'clock in the morning, the Desert Fathers called that the dark night of yes. the soul. Yes, yes. <laughs> Well, okay. and I think he was, he was sharing with you earlier yeah. that he gets up very early. He, he wakes up at three, but then he likes that quiet time because I'm not talking at him. Yes. <laughs> he can read and have so peace he and quiet. He, he doesn't know. come back at ten past three with a yeah. cup of tea. No. 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 So he's up, he's and then up you wake up. So I'm you wake up naturally at? About 5.30. You don't put an alarm on? No. No, you just write, and then yeah. what do you do? Well, in early... I think when we were in Sebastopol, and we were still struggling in our marriage, we decided that we needed to have a time together. And Rick had his own business, so he was getting up very early to make the East Coast calls at the office. And the only time that we could be together without the children you know, interacting with us was 5.30 in the morning. So we started our mornings together and did our devotion time together, and then he would go to work. So it just kind of has kept on that way. And we read a so devotional just, together. It, just run through that. Yeah. 5.30, you get together. Yeah. Do you have Rick a cup of tea at 5.30? Rick fixes me coffee. Yes. And then we read our devotionals and together. We're reading it loud. And then we pray together. And then I have my two eggs every day for my entire life. And um, I read my Bible, and he's doing his study and doing what he needs to do. 
And that's your daily routine. That's our daily routine. I don't feel it. You can't write for the Lord unless you start with the Lord. So I like the just being in the Bible gets your mind set in the right place. And very often, what I'm working on, there's always something in Scripture that pertains to that. And then I, I took Bible study fellowship for nine years and learned that, so I'm taking Bible studies when I can. What, what, so. what do you mean by that? What's that uh, mean? Bible study fellowship, I don't know if they have it here in the UK, but it's, uh, it's an intensive class where they, you have a certain body of Scripture and they take you through basically the entire Bible in nine years. And you, um, you have homework, and then you go with group time, and you have 12 to 14 women in the group. And what I love about it, you never talk about your denomination. You only talk about what the scripture taught you. Yes. And then you go into the lecture hall, and there's a lecture, and then you get your notes, and you go and study your notes, and then you have another the next sec section of uh, scripture that you study and you're answering questions to share the next week. Fascinating. So. You love the Bible. I love the Bible. Yeah, it's, the most, it's the most interesting reading in the world. Forget fiction, read the Bible. <laughs> the, the whole idea of Christian fiction is to get people back into the Word of God. It's to whet the appetite, so not replace it. Anyone, Francine, listening, uh, who doesn't have a regular daily routine, discipline, reading the Bible, what would you say to them? Start. <laughs> <laughs> I, originally, I didn't have an interest in reading it. And there is a lady in our church um, named Mary Baum, and she's, her mother wanted her to read the Bible, and she wasn't interested in reading it. She said, her mother said, well, would you pray about being interested? And she said, I, that wouldn't be an honest prayer. I couldn't pray that. So her mother said, well, would you pray about having an interest in having an interest in reading the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, okay, I'll pray that. And she is an amazing woman of God who loves scripture and studies the Bible. And I thought, well, if that works for her, it might work for me. So I asked if he would replace my interest in reading romance novels with scripture. And yes. he answered that prayer very quickly. And it's a matter of discipline, isn't it? Yeah. And, and once it's, you it's persist, it becomes part of your yeah. routine. It's a bit like, it doesn't matter how tired you are at night, you still brush your teeth. Yeah, but it's so much better than brushing and your teeth. And it's so much better than brushing your teeth. <laughs> but there's certain things that you will yeah. do if you keep doing them, yeah. and you yeah. know that they're good for you. Yeah. Yeah. Which is your favorite book of the Bible? Oh, I, if, I, if I could only take one with me, I think I'd take Ephesians. Because? It so it's all packed in there. It's a, I like the how-to in the Bible, the practicality of Scripture. So, but your, it's all really... It's all there for you. It's all there. What's your favorite verse of the Bible? Oh, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Go on. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not on your own understanding. Acknowledge Him in all of your ways, and He will make your path straight. I think that summarizes the Christian life. Go on, unpack that for us. <laughs> <laughs> now you're getting theological. Just a little bit, just a little bit. Well, Go on. the trust factor, you know, trust in the Lord in every aspect of your life, which is, you know, everything. And then I think my problem was always trying to figure things out on my own, so leaning on his understanding, you need to have the scriptures for that to learn how to live your life. And then just walking that walk day by day. It glorifies him. And that's your testimony of following Christ for how many years? 33. 33. Yeah. What I, have, I have trouble knowing when I was actually saved because I believed in Jesus as my savior when I was a child. But I think it it really changed my life when I was in my late 30s, and that's when I made him Lord of my life. So there, I think, I always think, well, I'm not sure when, but God knows, so I don't have to worry about that either. <laughs> I mentioned it earlier, but you were very calm. <laughs> I, that's I was very, calm. <laughs> it's, it's very endearing. Uh, do you get anxious? Oh, uh, yeah, I sure do. <laughs> I won't ask my husband in front of everybody. No. <laughs> yeah, I do. But you do seem to have that peace that passes all understanding. Yeah. 
he, you know, sometimes I need to remind myself, and especially at night, I think worries hit you most at night, maybe at that three o'clock time, and just um, to start praying, and praying for other people, primarily, gets you back on track. What would you say, Francine, to anyone who's uh, listening in uh, and they've always felt they wanted to write, but they never got round to it? What advice would you give someone who's desiring to do something like you? I think that if people have a real strong desire to write, God has already given them the ability. They just need to learn the craft. And the hardest thing about writing is planting your seat in the chair and doing it, starting on that first page. And then uh, my husband always says, the mouse that ate the elephant. You know, just taking it little bits at a time. And then if you did one page a day, you'd have 365 pages at the end of the year. So it's, I, I can't look at it as writing a book, because a book is overwhelming. But I can look at it as, I am gonna do four pages today. And that four pages, each day, as I'm obedient to tell the story that God's giving me, it'll, it'll finish. I don't know when. Sure. <laughs> Some of them are longer than others, and sometimes I have to rewrite. You know, I'll read it and think, no, that I haven't got it right yet. I don't know the characters correctly. The wrong thing is coming through. So it's just a process, and, and you, don't, you don't wait for inspiration, uh, because a lot of it is just hard work. So it's perspiration. It's, it's, yeah, it's just, it's not it's, looking at, I think people look at it as something um, exciting and different, and it's a nine to five job sometimes. You know, I have great respect and admiration for bookkeepers. Yeah. Because I can't even balance my own checkbook. They're, you know, it's like we all admire other people that are doing different things. So, so you would encourage them, just get on with do it. it. Just sit down and do it and see yeah. where it takes you. Yeah, because every writer has a unique voice too. Uh, people talk about their favorite book of the year, but for me, it's whoever I happen to be reading at the time, that's my favorite book because you're reading a unique voice. You know, everybody has a unique voice that they're presenting in their story. Millions of people have read your books, millions, in lots of different languages. Do you read other people's books? Yes, I do. Do you have a favorite author? The one I happen to be reading at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And are you, are you, when you read other people's books, mm -hmm. um, are you like analyzing it or enjoying it or enjoying it and analyzing it, I intrigued think, as to how they write it? I think, I think so. And there, there are some where I'm thinking they're just amazing, the way they, the wordsmiths the way they could put things together. Uh, and there's some wonderful young writers coming up that I think are just outstanding talents. So that's exciting to know there's a whole other generation coming up. Um, but I just, I do tend to analyze. I, th I think you, you can't really help but do that. But I'm also enjoying it and getting a lot out of it. I learn from anything that I happen to be reading. There's always a lesson in there. It's like every time you walk into church, whatever the pastor is saying, you're gonna learn something if you go in with an open mind and you're willing to learn. If someone hasn't yet read one of your books and uh, because they've listened in on this interview uh, and they want to read one, which one would you recommend first? Redeeming Love. Yeah. Do you think that's your best book? Uh, yeah, I do, because I think it was God's story all the way through, and it belongs to him. And if people have read Redeeming Love, which, <laughs> which would be your second, second suggestion? Mm, um, I don't know. What, it depends on what they like to read, if they like historicals or if they like contemporaries or if they like biblical fiction. They would have to just look at the list look and decide the list. for themselves. <laughs> yeah. How I do feel you funny recommending my work. What do you and uh, Rick do to relax? What are your hobbies? 
Um, well, we spend a lot of time talking. We watch movies. We like to travel. We've done a lot of traveling. I like to work in the yard. Rick likes to read early in the morning when his wife isn't talking to him <laughs> all the time. <laughs> yeah. And Rick likes to play golf and bowl. So, so you're a very chilled out couple. Yeah, I think, I think we're getting more chilled out as we get older. <laughs> yeah, so it's taken 49 yeah. years, but you're yeah. getting there. <laughs> yeah. Each year gets better. And what about this next season of your lives? You're looking good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I don't know. I'll just see what comes. Yeah. But uh, we're still traveling. We're still reading. As long as we can see and walk. Yes, <laughs> we'll you just keep doing it. Yeah, we'll just keep doing it. But this, think, uh, there's um, um, a quote, uh, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Oh, OK. Um, William Carey mm. was a great missionary that said that. Yeah. And I, I think sometimes we don't always expect great things from God, and we don't always attempt great things for, for God, do mm. we? And obviously, you're in a position, Francine, and uh, with Rick, uh, in a position of influence. Mm -hmm. And that influence does give you opportunity to this next season of your lives, maybe to do things that maybe some of us are unable to. Yeah. And I I'm not sure what that is. I know Rick has become an elder in our church because our church is going through a difficult transition, so he's very much a part of that, and we're trying to be very much a part of that, of helping the older members like us <laughs> to think differently about how to reach the young and yeah. not stay in the, the, the traditions of wanting things just the way they've always been for the last 50 years. Yes. So that's been um, a lot on our minds lately. Well, you know, there's two reasons why people are not Christians today. One, they've never met a Christian. Two, oh. they have met a Christian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an ouch, yeah. Yeah. How do well, you, I did, how I do you did think? Join a bunk, I did join a Bunko group in our neighborhood. I yeah? didn't even know what Bunko was. It's a, it's a, go, a um, dice game, but I thought, I don't know the neighbors. How do I get to know the neighbors? How do I, you know, how do I interact with the neighbors? So I'm part of that group, and I've been talking about Jesus and creation, and they're, it'll, we'll see if they let me stay in the group. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a yeah. good start, because yeah. sometimes churches often say, you know, go on a missions trip. And, yeah. and I say, yes, go on a missions trip, walk next door. Yeah, exactly. It's cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have to fundraise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but it's true, though, isn't it? Because yeah. um, we do all have a responsibility to live out our lives in our Jerusalem. Yeah. Well, and if we really think about what happens to the lost at the end of the line, we're, we are accountable. We need to be speaking to them. So, I know we, did, we have a house next door that was vacant, and we met the new, the new owner. And I, we invited him to the Bible study. He was like, oh, OK. Uh, well, we'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Give us a little time. Yeah. I remember um, when I was, um, uh, I wasn't a Christian, and I met a Christian, and he was telling me about Jesus. And um, he took me to see that film, um, and it had that song in it, I Wish We'd All Been Ready. Um, and it was like, it freaked me out, <laughs> you know, uh, what would happen if I turned my back on Jesus. Oh. And, uh, and there was an element of like, I didn't want to receive Jesus based on that particular thought. Uh -huh. And it was later on I discovered that actually he really did love me. Yeah. And I could receive him yeah. rather than receive him because I'm scared of the alternative. Yeah. I, we were recently in a church in Wimbledon and the young pastor said that God saved us from himself. And I thought, I had never heard that before. Yeah. But it was really a profound statement, I thought. Yeah. He loves us that much. He does. So. One of my favorite quotations is from St. Isaac of Syria, 
who I'm sure you're familiar with. <laughs> <laughs> no. In okay. the fourth century, St. Isaac said, I would rather be judged by God than my own mother, because oh. God will be more generous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's yeah. a lot of truth in that. I think, I think God yeah. is looking. Yeah. He's looking for ways to draw us in. Yeah. He's not looking for ways to draw us out. Well, I think, you know, when I became a Christian and you look back on your life, you can see where he was always there and wooing you and you just either, you turned your back or you walked away or you just had opportunity after opportunity. And he's doing that with everybody all the time. Yeah. We just don't have the eyes to see until, you know, he even gives us the faith to see. Yeah. But obviously yeah. you've got some... God has given you a gift, a discernment, an insight to be able to read a book of the Bible uh, and interpret it for a new generation of people. Uh, as you look at America, obviously you're more of familiar with your own country, your own nation and the world. What's your sense at the moment? that we are lost, we've lost our foundation because our founding fathers created a, a constitution that speaks of God and our culture is turning away and we have to impact it. I think that I know with my parents' generation, they, didn't, they felt like it was a private matter, religion was a private matter and faith was not to be discussed and Christians shouldn't be involved in politics, they shouldn't be involved in the inter entertainment industry, and then we kind of look at things now and wonder why are they the way they are. Well, when Christians withdraw from everything to protect themselves and their faith, they don't impact the world, and we're called to be salt and light. So we have to learn how to move out again and move into the society and, and impact the society. And, and what, I, what's your sense of what, what is it that God might be saying to us and the church today? Wake up. Wake up and get moving. Get out there. The fields are full and ready for harvest. Where are the workers? Do you think maybe you could retell that story <laughs> in, a, in a future book about the Possibly. urgency the urgency. Yeah. I mean, that's basically taking maybe John 4. Yeah. And, and well, that might be what the mentoring idea is, because mentoring has been on my mind for over a year. And really, older people, the older generation coming alongside and getting to know and building relationship with the younger generation <coughs> and mentoring them in faith. So that, that might be what God's calling me to do. I don't know yet. I'm still waiting. I know. <laughs> Well, this could be yeah. a little bit like a psychotherapy session. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm helping yes, you. Yes, yes. Helping but you. But you're trying to guide me. You know? So feel free to dedicate that book to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. but it's interesting that throughout our conversation, um, Francine, I, you know, I, I can feel and hear and sense that um, you love God and you love people. Mm -hmm. And that just permeates from you, um, and it, it's beautiful. I, I can see your love of Jesus, but, and your concern for people mm. who, you know, uh, to quote the Bible, are lost, yeah, broken. not knowing him and broken. Um, There's so many broken people now. You know, the family is broken down in our country, yeah, and that creates all kinds of problems. Have you planned your funeral? Yes. <laughs> now, it's all do you know care of. Why, listen, I say that because my, um, my father-in-law died recently and um, he put in his will uh, and asked me to speak at his funeral. And my wife and I were talking about it and, uh, and it prompted us to think, oh, you know, we should arrange and start planning what we want mm -hmm. and just put it in a drawer yeah. and, you know, Save it. I was thinking more about where we were going to be buried. Oh. <laughs> but there, there is a lot to that because um, I planned my whole mother's. My mother and yes. my uh, sister-in-law and I planned the, the funeral. 
and we wanted it to be all about Jesus. And in our church, the memorial services are all about Jesus centering on Christ because when you're a Christian, it's a celebration. It's a memorial of, of their life for Christ and that they're going to a better place, yeah. as the world would say, but they're gonna be with Jesus. And it's ministering to the family that's left behind. Yeah. But I haven't actually written it all out yet. No. What's your favorite hymn? Um, be Thou My Vision. That'd be a good one to have, wouldn't it? <laughs> what do you want written on your tombstone? <laughs> Rest in peace. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. How about yeah. I've been redeemed? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Ransomed, yeah. healed, restored, yeah. forgiven. Yes. Good. You, write that one down. Francine, you, um, thank you for being open, for sharing from your own personal experience. Um, thank you for telling us, letting us in on a little bit of who you are. And um, we thank God for you. Thank God for the books and the stories that you told. Uh, that have impacted us and inspired us and uh, and I'm sure I speak for others that our hope and prayer is that um, God will give you a couple more books <laughs> to write. Francine thank Rivers, thank you very much. Thank you.